Hi, I'm Lisa Messenger. Welcome to HP's In Conversation series, Business Not As Usual. My guest today is the amazing entrepreneur, Robbie Ball of Uncle Jack and Athletican. Robbie Ball, it is amazing to have you here today in my third bedroom, as we do during COVID. <laughs> Welcome to Business Not As Usual. How are you doing today? Thanks so much for, for having me. Um, we're doing okay. We're obviously having a rough time down here in Melbourne at the moment, but, um, you know, making do and, and making the adjustments that we need to. Uh, but as you said, business, you know, really not as usual. Um, so, yeah, interesting times. So I am super excited to talk to you today because I think you're one of the most phenomenal entrepreneurs. You've got e-commerce businesses. <laughs> and so for our the people viewing, I want to really dig into what have you done? What are the strategies? So let's kick off with who is Robbie Ball and have you always had an entrepreneurial flair? Yeah, so I, um, I obviously based here in Melbourne, as I said, um, I have always had that entrepreneurial kind of flair or, or kind of taste for um, entrepreneurial life. Uh, so I've always had, you know, something going on um, from, you know, quite a young age, really doing little silly businesses and so forth. Um, but, you know, my, probably my most recognised business to date has been Uncle Jack. Uh, so that's a watch company founded here in Melbourne in 2014. Uh, so we align ourselves closely with kind of the sports landscape. Uh, so, you know, as I said, that's probably been the biggest or well, the most recognised business to date. Uh, we've also got Athletican, which is a sneaker company. So that was started in 2017, um, and that's been really growing quite quite quickly as well. Now, I'm fascinated, and I want to dig into both of those businesses because I want to see, is there a blue tr blueprint and is there one singular road to success when you have e-commerce businesses? But first of all, when you started Uncle Jack in 2014, a lot of people would have gone down the traditional bricks and mortar route, but you started first and foremost as an e-commerce business. So tell me why you did that. It didn't even cross my mind to start, you know, a physical store. Um, yeah, and that, you know, I think that in itself has got the benefit of, you know, uh, it's, it's cheaper to start basically because you don't have the overheads from the get-go. Um, it's quicker to start as well. Um, you know, there's less you need to, to physically organise and, and get set up. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it, it never crossed their mind to, to start a physical retail store. It had been an advantage to us for sure. Now, that's interesting you say that because I suspect I'm quite a lot older than you. <laughs> and when I started my first, well, I started my first business 19 years ago, but when I started Collective Hub, I didn't think firstly digital first. I thought about a print magazine digital second at the time. Now it's very much inversely proportionate and it's absolutely digital first. So talk to me about what you needed to do because it sounds so easy for you. Well, I just started something online. What did that look like initially? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the foundations of starting a business don't change whether you're online or, or offline. You've still got to develop, you know, or source a product. Um, you know, you've got to come up with your marketing strategy. Um, you've got to have the resources, whether that be, you know, pe uh, people or, um, you know, capital and all that sort of thing. But I, I think in response to, you know, starting online, everything just seems to be, I think, quicker um, you know, it's a quicker process to, you know, set up a website as opposed to, you know, leasing out a, a store and, and getting it fit out and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the first thing is first, we, we had to come up with our, our product. Um, so having no experience basically in product development, that was a big learning curve. Um, and I'm sure it is for, for most people who get started in the, in the product space. Um, so once we had kind of, you know, uh, carved out a product that we were really happy with. Um, it was all about sort of getting to market quickly and, and coming up with our marketing strategy. So talk to me about that. So why watches? Because you're quite a rebellious, disruptive kind of leader in the market now and a lot of people I'm sure are looking to you. So when you come up for a product to market online, why watches? What was your thought process there? Well, at the time we... 
we started in 2014 and at the time it was really just dominated by, you know, your major watch brands that have been around for, for decades, basically. Um, so it, it's basically started for me looking for a, a watch for a friend's birthday, you know, walking around, um, you know, your traditional department stores and really just not loving the, the old school options, like the watches are, are, are quite complex and so forth. So, yeah, we really just saw an opportunity there to create something a bit different, um, perhaps targeted at, uh, you know, a, a younger demographic or, or the young professional types that weren't necessarily, you know, overly keen on um, the old school types. Uh, and I think there was also a sort of growing trend in 2014 towards like minimal sort of products and, and way of life. Um, so we, we were kind of a bit lucky in, in timing the market pretty well, I think. Yeah, I'm sure there was a bit of luck and I'm sure there was some great <laughs> business acumen and some clever e-commerce. So talk to me about the launch of Athletican then in 2017. So was it because watches were working and did you find out that it was almost ideation, supply chain, distribution, marketing, and you thought, okay, I can see another gap in the market? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned like Blueprint before. I think there's a very uh, broad or, or vague Blueprint that you can kind of um, follow or, or kind of, you know, we learned a lot of, um, from our mistakes in the in the first release, which allowed us to kind of avoid those. Um, so I, I think there's a bit of trial and error in that. Um, so yeah, I think it's all it's all very unique, and it's not a it's not one size fits all sort of situation. So what was the thinking though behind Athletican? Because it's quite a different brand. I mean, we're talking watches and basically footwear, which I suppose could broadly fit under the umbrella of athleisure. But why did you diversify into footwear or sneakers? Yeah, so both brands have a similarity in that they're both competing with really uh, fixed dominant brands in the industry. So in both scenarios, there's an opportunity to kind of carve our own niche. And, and being Australian as well, where a lot of our competitors are, are international, big international, you know, corporates. There's that opportunity to really create our own niche footprint. Okay, now this excites me because I love, um, you know, small startups, people who can duck and weave and be nimble and adaptable mm. and pivot and morph and iterate and change. So how are you finding it now when you've got some of the bigger guys who potentially have a bigger market footprint, potentially more marketing dollars. What are you doing that's different in the e-commerce space to really keep you ahead of the game? Well, I think we have the advantage in being smaller in some ways because we can be more nimble. We don't we don't have huge overheads. Um, we don't have thousands of staff, um, so we can do do things quickly. As I, as I mentioned before, I think that's one of our real advantages is to see an opportunity and just, you know, and just go with it without a lot of uh, bureaucracy, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if we, if we see something cool that's kind of trending or we see an opportunity in terms of, you know, for example, in, in 2014, um, I, I think we probably used influencer marketing as well as anyone was doing at the time when it was still really in its infancy. Um, so that's an example where being quite small and nimble, we were able to kind of capitalise on a trend without, you know, jumping through a lot of hoops. Now talk to me about that because I think a lot of people are like influencer marketing, collaborations, you know, how do we do it? And I've noticed um, particularly with Uncle Jack, I mean, you've got some extraordinary AFL players and all sorts of different influencers um, with large social media followings. So how did you actually engage with them in the first place? So my business partner with Uncle Jack is actually uh, an AFL footballer. So we had a natural link there um, from the start to be able to kind of get into those little clicks, I guess. Um, but but from there, I mean, it's, we we kind of created a bit more of a structured approach to um, collaborating with with not just AFL players but athletes in general. Um, so, for example, we did a collaboration with uh, Paddy Mills, NBA player, which was really really awesome. And 
probably one of our better campaigns. Um, so just our ability to kind of systemize that and branch it out, um, you know, create networks and, and, you know, I think that's something that, that takes time rather than, you know, uh, trying to start a business and in the first three months trying to go out and collaborate or, or work with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, you know, influencers. Amazing. I want to drill down on that a little bit because you said something really important before about bureaucracy and red tape. And I think the beauty about being entrepreneurial or in startup phase is that it's largely built on relationships. And so I think sometimes people over-engineer these things. But for you, how important has that been, just building connections and relationships? Yeah, I mean, it's funny how, you know, building a relationship or a connection with with someone or, you know, it might, it might even be like uh, an agent or something who can then uh, introduce you to someone else who um, can then, uh, you know, you can start something perhaps with a campaign or, or whatever. So I think that's really important. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's not the, the greatest idea just, as I said, go out and, and try and connect with everyone you can and see what sticks because it's not, it's not the greatest strategy. Uh, so my recommendation with that would be, is trying to connect to, to one or two you know, influencers um, that align with your brand and, and go from there. I think that's really important advice. I think what so many people do is they make an a, elaborate list and then they send free product out to everyone and then they wonder why it's never posted or shared. And I think it's really important to have genuine relationships and fits. I want to talk to you a little bit about the two brands during COVID and this kind of unprecedented level of restrictions that we're currently seeing. I feel like there's so many overused words at the moment and cliche for a reason because it's what we're currently living with. Have you noticed a big difference in how you've had to go to market? Because from a layperson's perspective, I would kind of like be, well, do we need watches so much because we're kind of at home? Um, but then I would kind of think, well, actually, your second brand, um, Athletic, and probably we're actually allowed to go out and run for an hour. So are you seeing a big difference in market share and what people are buying at the moment? Definitely, 100%. And I mean, you're spot on in terms of uh, watches v sneakers. Uh, watches, obviously, people are, uh, are going out less. You know, working from home a lot more. So it's probably it's probably not an essential purchase as such. Uh, I think it's still, um, you know, people still want to treat themselves, so to speak. Uh, particularly with, you know, I, I think there's less opportunities to spend money as well. Um, with people working from home. I know I was speaking to, you know, a few coworkers and some of my friends who. We definitely say they're spending a lot less money just on uh, on commuting and, and coffees and stuff like that. Um, but in comparison, Athletican, which is, you know, I think everyone's kind of brought out their inner fitspo in the last few months. So uh, the sneakers, have, and we've kind of had to, or we've not even had to, we've kind of just naturally adopted a, a, a strategy where we are really leaning into that home workout kind of, uh, you know, category. So we, we've got some personal trainers who've been doing live workouts on our social media. Uh, we've uh, been offering some like packs, like home workout packs. We've, you know, got some extra products like resistance bands and that sort of thing. So in that sense, we can really lean into it and it's very organic. I think perhaps uh, some commentary that I've seen around businesses uh, and, you know, unprecedented times is just perhaps a forced uh, perception that you need to do a big pivot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us in, in e-commerce, yes, we're affected, but we're not, uh, fundamentally our business model hasn't been turned upside down like a lot of industries have. So. I think it's, it's just about having empathy for the, the situation and, and, and that's really got to reflect, you know, your messaging and, and how you talk to your customers is the main thing. I love this. Okay, I'm going to go a bit further on this because this actually gets me excited and I would agree. I want to talk about both brands for a moment. So with Athletican, I'm big on the business ecosystem and diversification but still maintaining precision focus. So you just mentioned some really interesting things about tapping into this and i got to say I'm guilty of it, like the home workouts. I love a good home workout now. So that is sounds like it's a natural progression to kind of have, um, you know, 
online sessions and you know other different bits and pieces. So how much have you diversified your product offering and thus enabling further revenue streams for that brand during this time? Yeah, it's a really good, really good question. And you make some really good comments about, um, you know, adding additional products on to, to what we're already existing doing, to what we're already doing um, and creating that kind of ecosystem. But at the same time, as I mentioned, we, we haven't had to flip our business model on its head. So we, we have added some additional products that align with our messaging and what we're doing without necessarily changing our, our core product. If anything, they just add value to our existing core product. Uh, so I think that's really key. We haven't, as I mentioned, we haven't had to do a big big pivot or anything like that. Um, so it's just about being clever in your messaging and, and being genuine, I think. I think it's really important. And I think, yeah, Athletic and Sounds Like It's doing well. Uncle Jack, though, is there an opportunity to have some fun with it? I mean, do you suddenly have to take couch selfies about how you're wearing your fabulous watch at home or how have you actually kind of re-engaged with your customers around that? Yeah, I think it's interesting. And obviously Athletican's got the, the Fitzbo aspect, whereas Uncle um, Jack is, we're probably more targeted at, uh, you know, the young professional setting, but we still have that sports kind of niche so we are fortunate in that sense because we do have kind of sporty looking watches that we can, um, you know, uh, that work well in, in that scenario and, and pair with the athletic and tight um, product offering. Um, but, you know, we have been playing with, with some cool content with like um, our, our hashtag from the start, it's been own your time. So that actually works really well in, in this scenario with people working from home. So we've been able to get some really good content of that and, People have been sending in their photos, wearing their watch at their, their home desk and stuff like that. So, yeah, very different messaging, uh, which I think is important to, to be able to identify what, what that is. Brilliant. And I think such important messaging there. I mean, that's such a clever change of campaign because I think so many people who are used to going into a physical office, they have a certain idea of time. They high five their buddies in the hallway. They have meetings at certain times, but now it's all about rituals, routines and discipline. So maybe we all do need a watch to track our time, unlike what happens in the office. So have you seen any great pivots or changes from traditional bricks and mortar businesses out there? Have you seen people taking on the world of digitization that they might not have done before and who's doing it well? Yeah, there's one in particular that I really like and there's a, it's, it's an institution in Melbourne called 400 Grady, which is a uh, pretty iconic pizza uh, store. Um, so they, obviously the, they've had their business model turned upside down. So what they've done in going online is they've basically started like, it's basically a supermarket online. So what they're doing is, you know, you can't go in and, and eat a pizza there, but what they're doing is offering like uh, kits, like pizza kits with their ingredients and recipes and stuff. So you can actually buy the kit and, and make it yourself at home, which I think is just so clever and it's been really, really popular. I have loved, it's such a good example because I think the hospitality industry unfortunately has been one of the hardest hit and I think this is kind of almost the make or break of a business owner, isn't it? You either go, well, I've got traditional bricks and mortar, people need to come in, it's all about bums on seat, time at table um, and that's their primary revenue stream but I've also seen some beautiful examples of them doing live cooking shows and sending mm. pizza kits home so I think that's an amazing example. Have you noticed through this time from a customer service perspective has there been anything that you've had to do differently? Do people expect more now and also have there been any restrictions in terms of ability to mail products A and B supply chain? Have you been affected by either of those? Uh, in terms of the supply chain, we've been quite lucky in that they're all still operating pretty well. Obviously, there's some uh, delays, which we all know through the, you know, the postal networks and careers and so forth. But my honest opinion is I, I think, you know, even if it takes extra two or three or, or four days for an order to reach a customer, my honest opinion is that everyone is really sympathetic of the situation and, and totally understands 
what's going on. And, you know, a, a lot of it is out of our control and customers understand that. They understand the landscape. So I think it's just about providing prompt uh, responses of people's inquiries. Um, so in that sense, I don't think a lot has changed. We're, we're still very prompt. Um, in, 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 you know, all, all people want is, is an update on where their order is in terms of the supply chain. So, um, you know, as I said, for us, our, our, our business model or our supply chain and distribution hasn't changed too much. Yeah, well, that's lucky. And I think, as you say, people are a little bit more understanding. But I know for me, with my products, they're still like, you know, I ordered it yesterday. Why don't I have it today? There's still some of that going <laughs> on. So I think, you know, we're just trying to regularly communicate and things like that. So Athletican, you've started diversifying, I've noticed. So did you see specific trends about Fitspo at home? And how have you kind of tapped into that? Yeah, you're right. So obviously there's a big push towards uh, workouts at home because everyone's, you know, kind of stuck in home here in Melbourne. We're only allowed out of our house once a day at the moment. Uh, I so feel like we, I need to say sorry when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we caught on to that uh, kind of trend really early. So we've been able to adapt to that trend, I suppose, by incorporating um, some new products that add value to our core products. So, for example, we've we've added on uh, um, some uh, gym accessories like resistance bands that don't necessarily well they don't take away from our core product, but they just add value to our offering. So uh, that's an example of how we've been able to adapt to the trends of the situation on a more of a macro environment and, and provide additional value and support for our customers. I guess. Amazing. Talk to me about customer service in terms of providing free content versus additional revenue streams? Because I think there's always this interesting duality. People are like, oh, but I'm going to now do home workouts and I'm going to charge people, you know, $10 for every class. Like how much do you provide for free to value add to the customers and make your brand a love mark versus say resistance bands, which I assume are an additional revenue stream? Mm. Yeah, the, uh, I think there's a there's a line um, in, and I think it's it's for a lot of industries, and you probably find this yourself in terms of providing free content as opposed to what's what's paid content. Uh, and, and I think we've kind of found that out as well during this period. So with our free content, we see that as a genuine uh, offering to our to our loyal customers and social media followers, etc. So. We've got personal trainers doing live workouts and so forth on our on our Instagram and on our Facebook. Um, and again, that basically the idea or the, the strategy behind it is one, being able to offer something in addition, because that's you know kind of what's happening uh, in terms of the trends at the moment, but also it leans into our core product. So it allows us to uh, you know, as I said, add value and continue to sell our, our key products that, you know, keeps the wheels turning. Which is actually an extraordinary point because I think some people through this time have done things extraordinarily badly and others have really levelled up and are really shining and, you know, are, their customers are falling in love with them more and more. It's interesting what you're saying about that because I've noticed in the Fitspo industry there are some traditional bricks and mortar businesses that may have only had, you know, a gym offering and suddenly they're trying to take that exact model and replicate it online and charge the same, yet the customer's not getting the same value. So it's almost like they need to go sometimes the other way and offer that for free but find another way to pivot. So I'm going to push you for traditional gyms who offer that as a service. Do they need to now productize and take something into the e-commerce market? What would you suggest? Yeah, I think uh, I don't think there's one size fits all as you were speaking about earlier, but, uh, you know, I've certainly been thinking about the uh, the sports and the gym industry and, and, and how they can adapt you know gyms for example yes the uh, many have done well in taking you know our physical service and, and putting it online but there is as you said there's still that gap between uh going to a gym and, and using all the amazing facilities that they offer compared to you know many people are, are 
missed out on the on buying weights, so they're using water bottles. <laughs> so it's a big discrepancy between going to the gym and, and doing it online. So you're right, you, you have to adapt, whether that's developing a, a new product in uh, uh, e-commerce or perhaps it's information pro- or content-based products that uh, add additional value on top of what they're already doing. So, you know, I, I think you can you can uh, build out your business model beyond just transferring your service online. I feel like I could talk to you all day, so I'm going to push you again on this one. I, I use the word ecosystem a lot because I think it really enables us to future proof. And I'm very big on kind of the diversification of, you know, bricks and mortar and online. Do you think that many businesses now should start to diversify and, you know, productize in different ways so that if something else suddenly comes, we've, we can jump to another revenue stream? Yeah, well, I think that the buzzword in the last couple of years has been omnichannel. Um, so, <laughs> For good yeah. reason. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, a business, for example, it's not just uh, physical bricks and mortar businesses going online. There's been a really big trend uh, of traditionally online businesses, you know, creating uh, ex- experience stores uh, in, in shopping centers and so forth. So, I think it works both ways, but you're right. It, it's, I mean, diversification in terms of platform and, and offering is, is so, so important. So, uh, marketplaces have been uh, a huge uh, avenue for a lot of businesses that, you know, at, you think of Amazon, eBay, um, there's a lot of niche marketplaces like um, bike sales and so forth that, you know, you can really carve out a niche sort of uh, offering on those platforms as well as your own owned platforms, I suppose. And I think this is really important for people to tap into. I think too many people have just had one channel, they've relied on one singular revenue stream and suddenly something like COVID happens so unexpectedly and they're unable to, they're suddenly frozen and they suddenly have to turbocharge themselves into a new way of working. So yeah, so I would say if we can all gear up for the future. So one final question, you were talking about some of the big guys before. Do you think there are lessons that big corporates can learn from small to medium businesses? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I've read a little bit about sort of uh, entrepreneurship within big corporates where you have entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial thinking people uh, that can, you know, sort of have the authority to, to make nimble decisions because that's really, I mean, that's our strategic advantage is, being so nimble that we can make decisions and, and capitalise on trends quickly. Um, so, yeah, I think there are lessons to be learned from, um, you know, micro businesses um, that, that can adapt quickly. I think there's plenty of lessons there for big corporate companies um, in terms of um, marketing strategy, definitely. I love that you talk about entrepreneurs. I wrote a book in 2015, 2015, 2005 called Cubicle Commando and was all about entrepreneurs. It was well before its time and no one actually read it. (laughs) But I think the notion of entrepreneurship is so important. I think there's this huge, so many people think to be innovative, I need to become an entrepreneur. I need to have a startup. I need to do my own thing. But actually, we need great innovators and great thinkers from within the confines of dirty big corporations. So this is very, very good. (laughs) Robbie, any final words of wisdom that you would like to leave us with today? I really enjoy seeing uh, businesses successfully kind of adapt to to these situations that we're we're all facing at the moment in some way or another. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, businesses really should look at, uh, I think it's a good opportunity to look at their business models and, and we've done that as well uh, and looking at how we can, you know, diversify. You talk about the ecosystems, how we can future-proof our business and this is the perfect time to be doing that where, you know, again, there's no blueprint at the moment. There's no um, clear solution to, to everyone's problems. So it's a really good time to be testing new ways of doing things and and innovating and really keeping an open mind as to how your business can run. Amazing. Thank you. And if people want to follow you and find out more about how you're adapting and pivoting and staying afloat through these times, where are the best places to tap into Robbie Ball and your brands? Yeah, so Uncle Jack uh, 
uh, and Athletican. Athletican's with a K if you're Googling it, um, as well as uh, my website as well, RobbieBall.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for having me. Stay tuned now for our live Q&A.